Hey, welcome to episode number 66 of the Canadian Prepper Podcast. We're recording on May the 3rd, 2020. My name's Eric. I'm the host of the show. I'm based in Southern Ontario. Hunter, target shooter, for now anyways. Ham radio operator and computer geek. As a first responder, I've witnessed an over-reliance on emergency services during major events. And I started a small preparedness company to help people get prepared and be able to better look after themselves for at least 72 hours. My name is Ian. I live on Vancouver Island. I'm an outdoor enthusiast, sports shooter, and my farmer's designated handyman. I'm Alan. I'm a safety trainer, uh, first aid instructor, a whole bunch of other stuff, security expert, overall safety nerd. Sorry, I was on mute. I'm Hughes from Nova Scotia. I'm a Canadian Armed Forces veteran, volunteer firefighter and station chief, and also volunteer search and rescue technician and prepper. Uh, I've been preaching and living the prepper lifestyle to a varying degree for the last six years or so, and this came out of uh, necessity for the short and long-term um, survival of my um, family, which includes three young children. My name is Tyler. I live in Northwest Wisconsin. My hobbies include homesteading, metalworking, engines, guns, and the great outdoors. My wife, Colleen, is also joining us this evening to discuss the show topic of soap making. Hi, everyone. My name is Colleen. I'm Tyler's wife. Along with making soap, I enjoy metal detecting, foraging for wild edibles, gardening, hunting, playing with my barn cats, family time, and of course, doing anything to further develop our homestead. Awesome. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Welcome. And if you want to help keep... The if you want to help support the show and keep the Canadian Prepper Podcast on the air, buy a Canadian Prepper Podcast t-shirt at www.rapidsurvival.com. All proceeds help to keep the lights on and the backup generator fueled. All right, if you're enjoying the show, please take a few minutes and like us on Facebook and submit a review on iTunes. Also, we want your feedback, good or bad, or if this is a topic you want us to cover. You can email us at feedback at prepperpodcast.ca. All right, so we've got some uh, subonified content for you in this episode. We're going to start off with uh, some preparedness-related news articles, and next we're going to let you know what we've done for preparedness since the last episode. Then, of course, we're going to get into the main topic uh, this evening, which is soap making. Let's move into some news articles. Um, put a couple of articles out. I uh, found one really interesting about uh, about uh, Korea. Um, they've just can't just can't seem to decide whether Kim Jong Un was ever actually in surgery or uh, whether he has expired as a result. Um, but North and South Korea have exchanged shots across the DMZ. It's unclear at this point who initiated the uh, the firefight, but um, that's kind of how it goes. And so, dear leader may be okay. He may be dead. He may have a lookalike that is taking his place for right now. Um, so that was. Uh, kind of fun there and we'll see what we'll see where that takes us uh another item of news i didn't link to anything here because everything's been canceled but this kicks off emergency preparedness week uh yesterday was first responders day so to all the first responders both on the panel here and in the audience thank you for doing what you do um events uh, that highlight the capabilities of emergency services have been canceled across the across the world for this year. Uh, but I encourage everyone to do what they can to learn about your local services. Police and fire stations usually offer tours when there's no longer a gathering prohibition. Uh, most are happy to show off the, the tools when asked. Um, it's always a good time in my experience anyways. Uh, last few months, uh, have been fairly trying for most responders and medical professionals. So uh, if you ask, you'll hear a common thread. The best thing you can do to support frontline workers is to not do stupid things that require them to come to your rescue and take up medical resources. Plan to play safe, be prepared for emergencies, and only use the emergency room for life-threatening things like difficulty breathing, major bleeding, broken long bones. Use your family doctor, walk-in clinic, or urgent care center for the rest of your needs. Uh, May is also Stop the Bleed Month, and so take a class, www.stopthebleed.org, or contact me directly if you happen to be in southwestern Ontario. Get a kit. You can you you can get. Uh, we talked about that on an episode. What was that back in episode fifty one or something? Yeah, around there. Yeah, somewhere around there. Um, so listen to our episode on um, improved first aid kits, and you can order supplies to prepare one for yourself from RapidSurvival.com. Help save a life, maybe yours, maybe someone else's. Sorry to be mildly contrary. I got to put a uh, news article in there where uh, <laughs> I guess somebody, uh, an ER doctor was complaining there was too many open beds in his ER room. So uh, in spite of what the media will tell you, I mean, we've got uh, an article here that says the all the rooms are empty. I mean, he wishes they would actually end the lockdowns so we get back to like breaking bones and 
doing normal stuff, I guess. I don't know what it is. Hmm. I did some more digging, and it uh, turns out for all of Vancouver Island, which is about a 300-mile, 500-kilometer long island, six cases total of uh, coronavirus on the island. <laughs> so it's uh, it's kind of hard to justify shutting down the economy for six cases right now ongoing, and that's the peak so far. So I don't know. It's going to be some interesting stuff in, the, in hindsight to see what comes out in the wash as far as uh, you know risk versus reward. But anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in there. Um, and I don't know if anybody noticed, but uh, the Prime Minister put through a massive sweeping gun ban via order and council. What? When did that happen? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Brand new information. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, of course, it threw a link into the obvious, and uh, it's going to take us a while to digest, and I think we'll have to take that one apart now over an entire episode. But uh, for now, it's just a big sweeping, biggest use of an OIC ever in history. So there'll be a lot to say about that, maybe even on tomorrow's episode of Patriot, I'm sure. So. It doesn't affect me at all. No, yeah, no. Cast will be thrilled about this. Nothing, nothing yeah. to see here. Carry on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's all I had. I had uh, two articles from the local newspaper, the Amory Free Press. Uh, the first one is titled "Poultry People Present to Committee." So the Public Safety Committee uh, took a look at a proposal on April 27th via Zoom meeting to approve a City of Amory Chicken Ordinance. So currently, it's currently it's illegal to have chickens within the city limits. Uh, the Public Safety Committee voted on the proposal and gave the green light, so it's now going to move forward to the City Council for a final vote. Um, this article just kind of made me think of two things. Uh, first of all, local elections are very important, maybe even more so than national elections. I know right now in the states, especially the national election, the presidential election is getting a lot of attention, but there are kind of constantly uh, local elections going on and uh, just want to remind people to get out there and vote. Um, it really does make a difference, especially on the local level. And uh, especially with the pan pandemic going on now, register to vote by mail, uh, otherwise known as an absentee ballot. Uh, just takes a couple minutes to do, and they send the ballots right to your to your address. So, um, And then also another thing that made me think of is I've uh, lately been noticing a lot of new gardens put in as I drive to town to get uh, to do errands and whatnot. Um, a lot of front yards being tilled under. So I think uh, this whole pandemic is really kind of getting a movement started, at least in in rural small town Wisconsin here. I'm seeing a lot of front yards getting tilled under, which is uh, kind of nice to see. Uh, and the second article I had was uh, Amory Hospital and Clinic COVID-19 update. So uh, it was actually kind of nice to see that the uh, the local hospital put out a kind of a bullet point list of what they're doing for the COVID-19, how to contact them, kind of what they're experiencing on a local level. So uh, just another reminder to check your local newspapers for accurate and less biased information. And that's all I got for articles. Awesome. Well, I've got uh, one article here I guess with it being emergency preparedness week and everything. Uh, there is a local radio station in Fort Saskatchewan, Alberta, giving away an emergency preparedness kit. So if you're in that area and want to enter that draw, the link is in the show notes. Awesome. And for myself, I'm kind of covering on what um, Ian mentioned. Um, so the wide sweeping uh, liberal assault rifle ban um, kind of left both sides of the equation a little bit unhappy. I guess the antis were hoping for more. They were hoping for not having an amnesty, and at least for us, uh, it's something that is uh, definitely not good, especially because of the fact, just, just the way that they went about it. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I had, and Ian kind of spoke to it as well there. Well, we made it through a news, uh, news section with only mentioning Corona, I think, twice? My bad. <laughs> Impressive making progress. <laughs> no, we're making progress. That's good. Yeah, like I like it. All right, maybe we'll move into what we've done lately for preps. And what we've done lately for preps is brought to us by Super SE Straps. Visit them, superessestraps.com. They make really cool stuff. That they do. Uh, so for myself, so we're putting in some raised garden beds um, to expand our cultivable area. Um, along with a lot of yard work and property work. So those raised garden beds, it's going to be three uh, four-foot by eight-foot beds um, that we're going to use mostly for stuff um, that's a little bit more uh, fragile and close closer to the house so the kids can help out more with that. Uh, also switching out the bug out bag and get home back to the summer kit uh, and refreshing consumables and perishable items in those. Um, that's what I've been up to there in the past week. All right. For myself, uh, more yard work yet again. Starting to sound like a broken record, but... Uh... We got a lot of stuff to clean up, and I think we're finally done. So we're at a maintenance level now, which is nice. Uh, I got the the second round of seeds growing. Um, so this time it actually worked. I didn't go uh, over crazy with the water and drown them. So uh, yeah, we actually have uh, some stuff sprouting now. So that's uh, that's good, and then we can get it out in the garden shortly. And then besides that, I've been out uh, traveling for work, which I'll be doing again this week. So not <laughs> sounds fun. 
Oh, tons of fun. Yeah. So much fun doing that in the pandemic. All right. So for myself, uh, just actually our local shooting range actually reopened on a limited basis with uh, some social distancing built in. So we had to book yeah, it in rub advance. It in. Yeah, day in advance. So you have to book it and you only get 90 minutes to play and then you have to leave. And so I was able to go there and quickly set in a couple of things. But uh, more importantly, I managed to do some really poor brass scrounging. But at least I came away with more than I went there with. So that was good. Uh, but of course, nobody had been there for so long. There wasn't a whole lot to be had. So anyway, uh, let's see here. Hughes just reminded me I actually worked on my bob for the uh, the seasonal aspect as well. Uh, let's see here. Gathered up some giant cedar rounds. So about three or four foot around tree, 16 inch like rounds, like these big things. Uh, solid cedar. So I'll get, let them sit for a year to dry out properly and then uh, split them up. And they're going to be some, uh, some pretty kick-ass kindling for the next few years because uh, this stuff just burns like crazy. Uh, let's see here. Reloaded a bunch. I ran out of some reloading components already, so that's not good. Um, hopefully they'll... You know, between budget and availability, we'll make sure we sure we get that back on track. And unfortunately, my reloading seal, uh, like the auto powder dispenser, it broke after only like a year and a half of use. So, boo Hornady. Um, mm. Yeah, so maybe I'll go to an RCBS at the time. But yeah, it's something I don't really want to spend the money on right now. But it's kind of a hobbling thing. Um, what's, the, what's the warranty like on that? Well, it's good for one year. And, Probably a and, year, yeah. Yeah, so, so in a year yeah, or two months, of those. It, it, it dies and I, I took it apart, and there was like it looked like a burnt out motor or something. But I, I tried, uh, you know, fixing the connections and everything else, and nothing. And it it, it turns about half a turn, then dies. So, anyway, like yeah, pretty much. Eh? It's just it's it's pretty sad when they intentionally design these things to last just beyond warranty, and that's it. So, anyway, uh, that did the Costco vid run. Uh, had to line up for what forty minutes for it's like a Soviet style bread line. We you know we lined up. <laughs> We got our access, had to get our bread and then leave. And then, yeah, it's just fun stuff. Um, had some sickness in the family, so I kind of waylaid a lot of the preparedness stuff. And then just uh, on the daughter's car, changed her winter tires over to summer. And that was pretty much it. That's only a page. Under a episode, page. Yeah. Under a page. I was, wow. like, I, was, I was actually down for the count for about three days. So, unfortunately, I was a little low today. Okay. So, so 50% of those... Uh... COVID, COVID infections were from your household? Is that what you're saying? Well, I don't think we had the COVID per se, but yeah, anyways, yeah, it's not, not, not fun nonetheless. Uh, so for us, yesterday we did a uh, 26K hike around uh, around the lake here, um, which was horrific. Uh, the first like 15K were fantastic. The last, the la you know, the, the next like 10K were okay. And then the, the last two were just absolutely brutal. Uh, but I did carry it with my, uh, with my get home bag. And it was, uh, it, it reminded me that from, you know, from where I work and when I'm in town back here, it's probably going to be an overnight trip. So um, that was, uh, that was, that was a, that was a thing. Um, Zombie Lane got it right. No, rule number two is cardio. So we'll be, uh, we'll be doing that until it doesn't hurt anymore. Uh, other than that, a lot of yard work and a lot of uh, puttering and not a whole lot of practical things. Oh, yeah, for, for myself, uh, we finished planting our fruit garden with blueberries, blackberries. We got three types of raspberries, two types honeyberries, uh, strawberries, and rhubarb. Uh, we also planted two apple trees and two plum trees and fenced them off from the deer. Uh, replaced the hydraulic cylinder on my skid loader. Uh, did a grocery supply run the same day. Um, shut down, cleaned out the wood stove. So we're finally done burning wood for the winter. It's actually been really nice here the last couple days, about 70 degrees during the day and sunny. So we've been uh, outside quite a bit, getting some yard work done, kind of like everyone else. Uh, we did some weeding in the flower beds, top dressing with mulch, and straighten out some retaining wall blocks. And then I spent the last three days about clearing and grading a trail along the north side of my property. Um, I've also sourced eight feeder pigs from a local farm, and I'll be picking those up in about a week. And I rotated and refilled my gas and fuel cans as well. So that's what I've been up to this week. Nice. All right. Well, maybe we will, uh, with that, move into the main topic of the show and let uh, Colleen take over. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you again for uh, giving me this time to teach you what I've learned in the last few years of making soap. Um, so I'll start off again by saying my name's Colleen Shifsky. I am the owner of Squeaky Colleen Soaps. Colleen, like my first name. It's a great uh, name. <laughs> thank you. Thank <laughs> I like you. that. Um, so throughout my years of soap making, I've learned a lot of different techniques and tricks to make cold process soap. And I don't want to scare you right away, but soap making can be dangerous. 
So it's really important to edu educate yourself properly and make sure you know what you're doing before you jump into it. Uh, so stick with me. I'm going to try to break it down for you uh, step by step so you're not overwhelmed. Because if I could figure it out, you definitely can too. It's really not that hard. So uh, a little bit about my background and how I got started. Tyler's mom, um, she gave me all of the soap making supplies that I first started out with. So she um, tried making a few batches of soap back in 2008 and it didn't quite work out. So she put all the stuff in the tote and put it in the garage. And then a few years later I came around and she offered it to me. Um, she kept it because once you use the soap making supplies, it's contaminated and a lot of it is um, household kitchen items. So people could then uh, buy it at a thrift store or a garage sale unknowing that it could harm them. So um, I came along and I gave it a try and I loved it, even though it was really stressful. Uh, just making a handmade product in the end was was totally worth it for me. Um, so that being said, I mentioned I make cold process soap. Um, there are also two other kinds of soap making, hot process and melt and pour. So um, melt and pour soap is typically made with a glycerin base. It's very kid friendly because you don't need any lye. That's one of the three soap making ingredients. So basically you're just melting down and reshaping the existing soap that you had already purchased, adding some colors, herbs, and fragrances to it to just kind of make it more fun. It's really fast, but it is expensive, um, but there's no cure time needed. So you can use your soap right away after you make it. So that's pretty fun. What's the uh, danger of using soap too fast? Like if you use it right away? Uh, the lye can burn your skin, and I'll get into that a little bit more later on, but uh, when you're making it, there's also vapors that can harm your lungs, but if you use it too soon, it can um, cause a you know rash or even up to first. Yeah. And second. It'll, it'll cause a chemical burn if it's, uh, it takes about 24 hours to deactivate, so that's why soap ne needs time to cure, so if you use it too soon, the lye could potentially still be activated. So oh, that's cool. why... I a lot of people will use the melt and pour for their kids if they want an introduction to soap making just because it's not so dangerous. Um, and then, okay, so hot process soap is similar to cold process. Um, in hot process soap making, you take all of your ingredients and you put them in a crock pot and it's very hands-on. So you have to stand there for up to like eight to 10 hours and just stir it all together and cook all of the moisture out of it. Um, so it's pretty hands-on, it's kind of slow. Um, but it, since it's cooking out more of the moisture in the liquid, you have less cure time. So then you can use your hot process soap in about one to two weeks after you make it. Um, and then for cold process, the cure time is four to six weeks. So cold process is the traditional way of making soap. It involves measuring ingredients, taking temperature and combining things at the right time. It's semi-fast, you have more control over the recipe, and it allows for a lot more artistic creativity as well. And like I said, it's the more traditional way, so it's a lot more fun and rewarding for me to be able to make soap like that. Have any of you ever made soap? I, I don't think my wife would trust me with lie. <laughs> <laughs> no. Not even well, unclog I, the drain? Yeah, no, it's actually, yeah I, would it be septic friendly out of curiosity? Yeah, that's actually what lye is most commonly used for. Um, the chemical name is sodium hydroxide. Um, but yeah, people use it to put in their, you know, tubs and sinks if they're clogged up because it's it's harsh and it will it'll clean clean it out. So mm -hmm. I guess better than Mr. Plumber, I guess, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was just right. gonna say, yeah, like I've never made soap and I I didn't expect the first thing for you to say is that it could be dangerous, but now I recall hearing that it does um there there can be lie use in the process and I understand that there's some dangers involved with that. So yeah. um thank you for prefacing it with this, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I say I just can't wait because like ninety percent of the the knowledge I have about soap making is from Fight Club. So I did, <laughs> I, did I did the Fight Club reference last week, and then the same thing is like you know because I remember he said something about a chemical burn, uh, and that is that the lie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. There we go. Nineteen minutes in, and the uh, the Fight Club reference is coming. I, 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 can't, I can't resist, you know. So it's it's because of lye and water, right? Like that's that's the reaction. Yep. So lye on its own. Um, won't react until it's mixed with the liquid. So typically water in, in the recipe. So once it touches that or it's 
if it's not packaged right and is exposed to air, um, it can react in the container too. So you want to just be, be, be cautious, have gloves on, have proper ventilation going. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to start to get into the tools, equipment, and ingredients needed for soap making. Um, this kind of spells it out a little bit more. So if you are interested in starting out on your own, you'll know what you need. Um, so the first thing is a digital scale. You want one that's large enough to weigh up to a few pounds. So if you're making you know, 20 to 40 bars at a time, you have a large enough scale for that. Um, it's nice if it can weigh in both grams and ounces, depending on what your recipe calls for. Next, you're gonna need some mixing bowls. These can be either glass or stainless steel, but not aluminum. Aluminum reacts with lye. So that's one kind of special thing to keep in mind um, with that. So you're gonna want a couple sizes, small, medium, and a large of the mixing bowls. And then, so we're gonna be setting up a double boiler system. So maybe some of you have experienced melting chocolate or anything in the kitchen that yeah. would involve a double boiler. So you have um, a single burner hot plate. Um, some people make soap in their kitchen. I just highly recommend um, opening up windows and just being extra cautious with ventilation if you don't have a designated soap making area. Um, so we have the single so, burner. So interject there Colleen is the is there a danger like if I put if I wanted to do this in my kitchen and I just ran my like my standard exhaust fan would the fumes potentially react with whatever else is in the in the fan um no I don't think you'd have a problem with that mostly with the fumes you're just worried about it um you know direct contact with your face and breathing it in um but as far as reacting with anything else I don't think that would be of concern awesome thanks um uh, yeah of course so on top of our single burner hot plate, we're gonna want a large kettle or a stock pot to hold some water. So that can be heated up to create the steam. And then on top of our kettle, we're gonna set our largest mixing bowl. So make sure your bowl is large enough to fit on there so it doesn't sink in and get stuck. Um, so we'll use that system to melt one of the other ingredients, which is our fat or our oil for the soap. And I'll get into that again a little bit more later on after we're done going through the tools and equipment. Um, so another thing we'll need is an immersion blender. This is a handheld stick blender. Um, it works fantastic for just, you know, making sure everything is fully stirred in and immersed. It is optional, but I do highly recommend it. it if you don't have one, you're gonna be using a 100% silicone coated spatula and it will be a lot more hands-on. It'll take a lot longer. I'd say maybe even up to like 30 minutes longer without that immersion blender. And they're not, not too expensive, usually under you know 25 or $30. So if you can get one of those, it's worth it. Is that just to make sure that everything gets mixed thoroughly for the reaction to happen or is that? Yeah, yep. So we'll have our heated up oil and then we'll mix our lye with our water. And then we'll be taking the temperature of those. And then once we combine those two together, that's when we'll, we would use the immersion blender to just really make sure it's all mixed in. And um, yeah, so um, I briefly mentioned temperature. So to take quick, accurate temperature, I like to use an infrared thermometer. Um, it's very hands off, very quick, very accurate, not very expensive. Um, a traditional thermometer will work, but I would have concerns of cross-contamination just from going from your lye water to your oil. Um, so if you can invest in an infrared thermometer, that's a great route to go. So you're also going to need something to put your soap in. There's a lot of different options for soap molds. My favorite are just the, it's a square wooden box with a silicone leaf in it that sits in there. Um, I don't put anything over my soap molds after I pour it in there. I just let it sit out in the open. So silicone works great. Uh, there's also candy molds that are just smaller shaped, again, of the silicone. Um, if you want to make like circles, shape, circle shaped soaps, you can use PVC pipe. Um, and I recommend lining that with a plastic table mat so you can easy 
have better removal of your soap when it when it's cured and ready to come out. Um, some people use Pringle chip cans. That way you don't have to line the mold. You can just kind of peel the wrapping off and then reveal your soap that way. Um, Obviously a one time use. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Oh, I, I just had a question with like if you're going to use a PVC pipe or something, could you use um, a release agent um, like a silicone spray or even like just um, like canola oil or something like that? Um, well, the, I I don't use any other oils, but I use like a plastic table mat that you know Grandma always had on the table for us right. kids when we were eating dinner. Yeah. Um, I roll that up and put that in, and then pour my soap inside of that. If you were to spray it with another kind of oil, um, since oil is one of the ingredients, that will then become part of the recipe and react and still be stuck to the, the inside of the plastic mold. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, you can use any kind of wooden box that you have laying around as long as you line it with parchment paper. Just kind of tape it down, make sure you get all the corners. It might be a little bit more sticky to take out, but if you use a chef knife, you can you can still get it out and make that work. And that also goes for any cardboard boxes as well. Uh, I've seen quite a few people use shoe boxes. That works pretty nice. Um, so there's a lot of different options for soap molds. That's kind of uh, more on the artistic side, whatever you prefer to use. And then to cut your soap, obviously a chef knife works great. Um, I also like to use a pastry cutter. They've got some crinkle cuts to it. And then there's also just a straight cutter too. So it makes for, um, it makes it bubble up a little bit more if you use the pastry cutter. That's kind of cool. Yeah, it's kind of fun. People really like that. I guess so, at the, uh, I, I guess at the, like the thrift store, or the, what do you ever call it, the next to new store, uh, they'd probably have a bunch of silicon thing, stuff you could buy there as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's the best way to get all this supplies is thrift stores, garage sales. Head of Goodwill. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> if mm -hmm. you know people that, are trying to downsize and get rid of stuff, just let them know that you can use it for, for soap mm -hmm. making. Is there an advantage to using one shape over another or is that purely aesthetic? Um, I, In terms of curing, I don't think you've really noticed any difference, have you? I think soaps tend to set up a little bit quicker in the PVC circle molds because there isn't any airflow through that and there, I cap one end and leave the other end open. So it's really doesn't get much airflow. In the wooden boxes, there's a lot more opportunity for it to kind of breathe and it doesn't set up quite so fast. Mm -hmm. So it makes it easier for me to then cut. If it gets too hard too quick, it can be kind of crumbly and not turn out so nice. So a little bit of a, a timing thing with that. I think it's more just personal preference, what you kind of like using in your hands, round or square bar. So it's not just for burying firearms anymore, then. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Multiple uses. They're like five-gallon buckets. You can use PVC for everything. Yeah. So now um, some of the PPE, the equipment that you'll want to use, be safe. Um, paper towels. Anytime there's a spill, wipe it up right away. You want to make sure that it doesn't get on your skin. Um, even on your work surfaces and your tools, just quick wipe it down so you're avoiding any cross-contamination. Um, I love having my disposable gloves on hand. I, um, I'd i love to get some that are a little bit longer. Uh, my aunt is a dairy farmer. She's got some gloves that come down to her elbows for milking. Um, I think that would be great because my wrists are typically the most vulnerable area. So I always make sure to wear long sleeves, long pants, closed-toed shoes when I'm making soap. Um, and then I also have a, like a face mask shield that I'll wear. Um, if I'm wearing contacts instead of my glasses, I'll make sure to put some, some eyeglasses on as well. So I don't want any exposed skin that could get splatters on it. When I'm using the immersion blender, it can kind of kick up a little bit. Um, so just to be extra safe, you want to make sure you have those, um, that PPE on hand. And, uh, uh sorry, I just looking for it, uh, but do you think about uh, like a breathing apparatus or any sort of, do you need a mask of any sort? Um, it, it is good to wear one um, in conjunction with having a fan and an open window, just anything to make sure those fumes, and really the fumes only come up when you're right after you mix the lye with the water. Mm -hmm. um, so for the most part, just 
keeping open ventilation, but I, I do recommend if you can get your hands on one, definitely, definitely wear one. It's not going to hurt. Yeah. Your, your lungs aren't going to be like burning from breathing the fumes in, but like everything, be cautious, open the windows, turn a fan on. Um, yeah. it's, it's not going to be like mustard gas or anything crazy like that, but you might get no. a, I'd say a headache would probably be the first sign that you don't have good ventilation. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. But I, I've never had any problems with that. I have got a few burns on my wrist here and there, but nothing serious. You just wash it off with cold water and soap right away, and it's taken care of. So, cool. um, yeah, again, if you can have a fan, that's that's one of the last things for um, the tools and equipment. Now, I'm going to get into the ingredients. We've kind of mentioned them already, but so we've got lye, oil, and the liquid. So those are the three basic ingredients. So with oil, it can be from like vegetable oils or animal fats. So some of the popular oils are avocado, castor, coconut, grapeseed, hemp, lard and tallow, um, mango and shea butter, olive oil, and vegetable oil. So there's a lot of different options for you to use. Um, the oil is what holds the properties to actually that you actually feel in your soap. So like how hard it is, how big the bubbles are, how moisturizing it is on your skin. Um, all of those properties are coming from the oil and fat that you choose. So to get more of those properties in your soap, I recommend using like two to five different oils. Um, you can kind of play around with that and feel um, what you like in your soap. Uh, you can look up all the information online about each of the oils um, and how those properties will carry through in the cold process soap. So you kind of know ahead of time what you're getting into. If it's like coconut oil is a really hard oil, um, so you might want to pair that with something that's a little bit more soft, like a grapeseed oil. Um, is there, uh, like we said, animal fats, do they have to be uh, rendered before? That's correct, right? Yes. Yep. So that's what I recently switched over to do in the last... Oh, probably three, four months now. I've been mm -hmm. making all my soaps with um, rendered down um, beef tallow and pig lard. So it's it's kind of a, a messy, dirty job. You got to, you know, chop it all up, make sure there's no organs left in it. And then I just cook it down and I pour it off into buckets and it's shelf stable for up to a year. So that's awesome for me. Um, yeah, it's actually interesting. Like uh, we actually rendered down some bear fat last year and... Um... Yeah, you got to make sure there's no little uh, bits in there for sure, right? And then you just yep. drink afterwards, and it is—it's very interesting because yeah, you can smell exactly what it was eating based on the, the, the <laughs> yes, you can. Yeah, so. yeah, it's amazing too. So when you said that it's okay. shelf stable for a year, is that is that the fat that you rendered or or the soap? Yep, or that's the fat that I rendered. Okay. Um, the soap shelf life, um, again, any and any vegetable oil too will be about one to two years, and it will say if you do a quick Google search, like the shelf life of that oil. But once you turn it into soap, um, I, the longer it, the longer you have it on the shelf, the harder of a bar it's going to be. It's going to have more time to cure. Um, the fragrance might fade over time, especially if you're using essential oils versus soap fragrance oils. Those will, those will fade a lot faster. Um, but yeah, I'd say it's good for up to six, seven years, 10 years. Um, yeah, I, as long as you're storing it under good, like everything, dry, cool, dark place. Um, but yeah, we've, I mean, soap that you made three years ago now is just as good as the day it was brand new. So yeah, yep. It still smells really nice mm -hmm. and seems to work fine for me. So yeah, it's fairly shelf stable. Um, okay, now a little bit about lye. So when you're making soap, you want to make sure it's 100% lye. Read the label, make sure you know what you're buying. Um, it typically comes in either small granules or flakes. And anytime you're holding it or using it, have your PPE on and make sure there's ventilation going. When we pour it, you want to make sure you pour it really slowly so you have full control over it. And then once we measure our lye, we want to make sure we're always pouring that container into the liquid um, so you have more, you know, more control over whatever substance the lie is in, just so you're avoiding splashes and um, 
not getting any lye where it doesn't need to go. So I typically buy it from the hardware store. Um, that's one of the only places you can find it around here. Mm -hmm. Large stores like Walmart and Menards don't really carry 100% yep. lye. Ace Hardware is kind of where we always go. You always look like a crazy person when you're walking out of there with 20 bottles of uh, drain cleaner. But <laughs> yeah, it's, I was going to ask you, like, um, is it a, is lye expensive or is it um, is it do you have to special order it or anything or is it just kind of like not in the United States, anyways. Uh, at least, not yet. Not, yeah, not in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Um, you can just go into the hardware store and buy it right off the shelf. It's what three to five dollars a bottle, I'd say. Yeah, four four dollars a pound, typically. So, um, but it is used. Yeah, people use it when they make meth. So unfortunately, <laughs> I lock it up. I put it there in it a safe. Yep. <laughs> That's why there's not access to it. And for a good reason, it shouldn't get into anybody's hands who doesn't know how to handle it properly mm -hmm. for Same reason intended why I can't uses. Like medicine anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So well, I've got it all in a safe down there, and I feel a lot better about that. But that is something to keep in mind. As a soap maker, you should know that. So, so we oh. can make soap, and if things get really bad... Yeah, it's multi-purpose. Multi uh, just need some ether and yeah. Yeah, well, actually, now I'm going to tell you how you can make your own lye too. Um, for soap making, it is made from hardwood ash. So we have a wood burning stove, and you mix that with rainwater. So through a filtration system with buckets or tubs, whatever you have for a setup, you basically just put the ash in there and let the rainwater drip through it slowly, and then that will um, turn into the lye water. And there's a few different ways that you can test how, how ready it is for soap. Um, the more traditional way is to float an egg in it, um, take a fresh chicken egg, and if it's ready, there'll be about um, a, a dime to a nickel shape exposed of the top of the egg. So it'll partially float a little bit when it's at the right acidity level for soap making. Um, that's that's pretty old school way of doing it. You can also use a hydrometer. Um, that's very accurate and will let you know where you're at. So if you need to wait a few more days and allow more water to soak through and seep in, um, then I believe that gets the, the potassium then from the ashes is seeped into the water. So that's what we're... So we're making with that. So I'm glad I'm glad you mentioned the fresh egg part because the old eggs will float no matter what. So yes, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. So you can make your own lye too. Uh, if you save your bear fat, make your own lye. You can really have no cost into making soap. So that's a pretty awesome thing. If you um, had like an unscented, like I guess a or an unscented soap would be the best way to put it. If you just had like straight lye and straight fat. It's still the usable soap, like ivory or something, or how does it kind of? Yeah, absolutely. Out? I have some of that for sale on my website. It's mm -hmm. just I made. It's got beef fat, pig fat, goat milk, and lye. That's it. And wow. It doesn't mm -hmm. smell like fat either. It's kind of amazing. Like once it actually turns into soap, it really doesn't have much of a fragrance to it at all. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. you mentioned cost. If you were to just go and buy your, um, I mean, if, if you're not rendering your own fats and make your own line, all that kind of stuff, and just buying the ingredients from the grocery store or the hardware store, um, how much are you looking at for a given amount? Like, let's say like one pound. I'm just trying to com compare like the 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 economics of it, of making it compared to yeah, buying it on sale at Costco, of course. let's say, right? Yeah. And I, um, I kind of learned the hard way on that one. So when I first started, I was buying my oils, um, kind of pre-mixed vegetable oils. And that was, it's about, it was about $100 for a five gallon bucket um, of pre-mixed oils. And that's on the wholesale business side of things. If you're gonna be buying coconut oil from, from Walmart to make your soap, um, it's gonna cost quite a bit more than it would be to buy ivory off the shelf. And then um, approximately how many bars of soap do you think that five gallon bucket of oil would, would produce? Probably 500 bars. Okay. So, um, I would say for me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I I would say on average probably expect um, anywhere from probably about 80 cents to three dollars per cost of bar on on your end to make it. Mm -hmm. um, it really varies on on the oils. Some are super expensive, like vitamin E oil. Uh, it has great benefits, but you're gonna pay for it. Yeah. Um, but that, that's something I'm really I'm really proud of as a business owner 
just kind of making that step to be more sustainable and be able to use animal fats that would normally go to waste. And I can turn it into, you know, a bar of soap that people can use. And I think the biggest thing with homemade soap making is maybe less of a cost effectiveness. And you just look at the ingredient label on your store-bought soap and there's dozens and dozens of ingredients that you can't even pronounce. And um, they don't need to be, a, you know, a four ingredient bar of soap is just as good. And, uh, you know, these are proof, I guess. Yeah. And I would say, if, at least for us, that's probably the bigger, bigger concern. Maybe not so much of a cost savings, but just the self-sufficiency aspect of it, as well as a safer, better product that you're putting on your skin dozens and dozens of times a day. Um, and the skin is, after all, the biggest organ on your body. And yeah. Right. And I think that for me, I mean, cost is only one of the aspects of it. Obviously, right. mm -hmm. like there's um, an artisanal value to it as well. There's a sustainability piece. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. there's, Time there's too. Being good for the environment, meaning, you know, that you're using four ingredients instead of 24 chemicals, right? So, yep. mm -hmm. yeah. And it's a yeah. great skill to have too, because I mean, you know, people were hoarding toilet paper, but uh, mm -hmm. for the pandemic, but soap is just as important, if not mm -hmm. more. Right? So. Yeah. Well, I've noticed a, a definite increase of sales. Mm -hmm. since since covid so i'm not complaining it's a great time to be a soap maker <laughs> um yeah so if you if you have a lot of money not that much time i'd say go ahead and buy all your ingredients make make a couple big batches at once because it's not going to go bad you have the the shelf life on on your side um but you know if you want to um, have have more uh, more pennies in your pocket there. Just take your time, render your own fat, save it up for a while. You can make your own lie too, and it, it'll work. It just depends on on how you want to do it, but you have total freedom to spend as much or as little. And so, and are there any out. special considerations for storage? Like, would you store it in like a let's say like a parchment paper or something? Or um, yeah, there's there's a few different ways I've seen packaging. Um, I personally choose to use like a it's a shrink wrap plastic bag. Um, for me, it's I sell at a lot of farmer markets and have quite a few wholesale accounts. So they like that just for, you know, presentation and I can have my labels right on the outside of it. Um, a lot of people just use different paper, string, little boxes, just mm -hmm. kind of wrap them up. Um, but if you're just if you're making bulk soap for yourself to store it, just put it in a cardboard box in the closet, uh, wherever it's get wet wherever it's going to stay dark and dry and cool okay Sweet. but yeah if, if you're packaging for resale then you'd be looking for like shrink wrap or something like that but you don't need to do that if you're just making it at home for yourselves yeah um so another thing i'd like to talk about is the liquid in the in the soap recipe so the liquid is the third ingredient um most recipes will call for water and that's just the basic basic route to take. Um, I make goat milk soap, so I kind of take that route. People have used beer, coconut milk, green tea, wine, coffee. Um, you can get as creative with it as you want, but just know that any of those things that you're putting in will change the, the chemical reaction of, of the lye when you added it. And so do some research and make sure you know what you're getting into ahead of time. Yeah, first time soap maker might not want to try the the beer or the green tea soap. Probably stick with the water. So. Yeah, I would probably <laughs> drink the beer. <laughs> yeah. um, where where does one do that research? Like, what's uh, are there um, specific resources you would recommend? Yeah, there there are two main soap suppliers. One is called Brambleberry, and they're out on uh, the U.S. West Coast, and the other is called Bulk Apothecary, and they're on the East Coast in in the U.S. Uh, but they are, you know, basically the, basically the two main soap suppliers in in our area that I can find. So, and they've got just lots of information and videos, and I've I've learned a lot from them. Uh, but that's Brambleberry and Bulk Apothecary. Um, one more thing to mention with your liquid. Um, so when we add the lye to it, that chemical reaction starts and it heats up. So to better control the temperature, um, try using your frozen liquid, so ice cubes for milk. Um, so that'll that'll help a little bit later on. That's kind of an insider trick, but using a frozen liquid with your recipe um, will make it much more enjoyable. Is it just a better product if it stays cooler, or is it just a, uh, for comfort for you? Um, it's 
It's more about the timing. It's kind of uh, you need to time things. The the two separate mixtures need to be at the same temperature, so you have a little more control over how fast that oil heats up. So you make sure they're both at the right temp before you mix them together. Um, I think it, being the frozen liquid just gives you a little more time to work with it and makes it a little easier. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, just um, and I'll I'll get into that a little bit more later on. Sorry, I'm, I'm still working out the no worries. process of this, but. Um, so I'm just going to quick finish here going through some herbs and exfoliators that you could put into your soaps too. If, if you choose, again, it's not, not necessary to actually make soap, but any herbs or, you know, poppy seeds, coffee grounds, oatmeal, um, anything like that that you want to add in that's a natural exfoliant, that's awesome. That'll work great. You can use dried or fresh herbs. Um, and then with fragrance, I mentioned you can use essential oils or soap making oils. The essential oils might fade, but soap fragrance oils will last for usually three, three years. Um, and then to color your soap, I use um, cocoa powder, turmeric, curry, spirulina, charcoal, indigo powder, cinnamon, um, a lot of those natural things that we find in our kitchen. Some people will use mica powder, and this is a natural stone mineral that's shiny and glittery. Some people um, are allergic to it, so I tend not to use that. Even though it is a lot prettier, um, I just don't like taking the chance that somebody could have a reaction to my handmade soap. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I have for you guys on the tools, equipment, and ingredients for soap. I know that was kind of a lot, so... Um, I'll just take a take a quick moment to let that sink in. Um, again, with soap making, I mentioned in the beginning that anything that we use is contaminated. So make sure that it's all labeled and set aside and that you're just being really safe with your equipment, that your kids aren't getting into it, or if you have a babysitter over, they know not to use that bowl for mac and cheese instead. Um just yeah, just actually on the note. So uh, you said they're contaminated. So just it's more of a uh, poisonous thing at that point. Yes. Yeah. So even if you're um, feeding your pets or watering your plants with a bowl that you had poured lye into, um, you really, I mean, you you wash your soap dishes in between use, but just just to really take it seriously, so it's not ingested. Um, okay. The other thing I was going to ask, like you said, not to use aluminum, right? Correct. Yes. So is, it, is, is that like a chemical reaction to the lye as well? Yep. Yep. That's exactly right. So like um, little bread loaf pans, like don't use those. Those are made of aluminum. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that that would be wise because it reacts with the lye. And so, I most of the pans in my house are probably aluminum, right? So. Well, I was going to say, is it like an explosive reaction or just a, a fume reaction or how does it work? Um, I guess I haven't tested it out. <laughs> let, him, let him find out. Let him find out. Yeah. 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 I'll I'll back to you next episode. week. Yeah. So, Hughes, yeah. you try to make some soap at home. Yeah. And if you reappear on next week's episode, we know it's not a big explosion. Yeah. 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 No. It's kind of like the hold, hold my beer, watch this. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I, I would assume it would just kind of burn through um, okay. pr pretty quickly mm -hmm. and just kind of fall apart. Oh, well, then I'm trying this. I mean, yeah, I, <laughs> Brandy, I mean, I haven't checked, but I'm sure lye is probably a controlled substance in Canada, just like everything else. Like mm -hmm. Most likely. Well, well, now that we've mentioned it, it's going to be banned. Yeah. <laughs> is, is it fun? Yeah, that's banned. Yeah, can't do that. <laughs> oh. All right. So we've already talked a lot about the actual process of making soap, but in a nutshell, we're heating up the oil. Then we're going to mix the lye with the water. And then we're going to mix the lye water with the oil and then pour it into our soap mold. Um, so that's in a nutshell what I'm going to be covering next and more of the, the detailed kind of how to actually do it. So there's two terms in soap making that are kind of important to know. The first is saponification value. And this is the amount of lye that it takes to turn one gram of oil into one gram of soap. So using the exact amount of lye you need to make the exact amount of soap with nothing left over is a 0% super fat. So super fat is the other term. So 
Many soap makers like to have leftover oils in their recipe that aren't bound to the lye, and that can be anywhere from 1 to 20% super fat. So to, okay, now I'm going to define super fatting for you. Uh, this is adding an excess amount of oils to the batch beyond those calculated to completely saponify with the lye to bring out more of the oil and fat properties, such as the bubble size, hardness of soap, how moisturizing it is, etc. So that's just something to keep in mind too. Um, you know, if you want, if you have extra oil to use, increasing the super fat will bring out more of those properties for you. And the uh, the term saponification, that's just a description of the chemical process. Yep, it's more. It's kind of a ratio. Um, so it's the amount it takes, the amount of lye it takes to turn one gram of oil into one gram of soap. Cool. Um, so when we make our recipe, uh, I am going to refer all of you to brambleberry.com. They have a lye calculator, probably a couple other lye calculators out there as well. But this is the safest way to design a recipe. Um, it's pretty simple. It takes you through basically three boxes and you type in, it asks you if you either are making solid soap or liquid soap. So you click solid for the type um, and then you either choose ounces or grams and then the super fatting level. So once you have that information typed in, the next box will come up. And it will ask, it will give you a list of all the different kinds of soap making oils. So the avocado, castor, coconut, beef tallow is on there. And you'll go in and you'll type how many ounces or grams of that oil you want in your recipe. So on your end, you just have to decide what kind of oil and how much of it you want. Okay, I hope this is making sense for you guys. It's kind of technical, but if you're on the the lie calculator and it's right in front of you it'll it'll spell it out for you pretty easily that makes sense so far yeah, yeah. Uh, total sense so far thank you yeah I'm, I'm glad it does and so the recipe spell out the exact amount of lye liquid and oil or fat that you'll need so you'll have no questions about how much soap you'll be producing um even you know down to the exact amount you'll know exactly what you're getting into um so you can be prepared so you're not overflowing your molds or you don't have enough molds for your soap. Um, all right, so that's that's how we make our recipe. Uh, again, I hope that not too technical. Just just give it a try. Once you have your your different fats, try to have two to four different types on hand so you can get the different varieties of benefits. Dumb question on the soap molds. Uh, mm -hmm. Does when you actually mix the oil and the and the lye, does is there actually expansion at all, like kind of like bread dough, for lack of a better term, or is it just like it's just like this maintains the same volume? Um, it maintains the same volume for the most part. Okay. Um, okay, now I'm gonna go through uh, just kind of the step by step on how to make the soap. So I'll start out with a totally disinfected and sanitized workspace. Um, prepare your salt molds. So if you need to add any parchment paper into your boxes, do that ahead of time so you're not monkeying around with it later on. Um, then we're gonna start out, we'll have our double boiler going. We'll put, um, we'll first weigh out our oil and have that on the heat and we're gonna be looking for a desired temperature. And this is gonna be in Fahrenheit, so 120 to 130 degrees Fahrenheit. 48.9 to 54.4 degrees Celsius. Don't worry, um, we're, bi we're, we're bi biometrical up here. We can handle both. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I wasn't sure. I was pretty nervous about that. Yeah, no, it's all good. You can use Fahrenheit. Most, most of our baking is done with Fahrenheit up here. Okay. Yeah. How brave of you to admit that on the air, Ian? What's that? How brave of you to admit that on the air? Oh, that I, swing, <laughs> that I can swing, swing both ways with temperatures? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> here we go. Um, yeah. So we're going to... You know, be looking for that desired temperature of 120 to 130 degrees Fahrenheit for the oil. And that's also the same temperature that we're looking for for the lye water. Um, so you know, weigh out your water, set that aside, put on your gloves, your face mask, make sure your ventilation is on, and then weigh out your lye. 
So once your lye is weighed out, you wanna make sure to pour that into your water. Don't pour your water into your lye because there's less control and there's better chance for more splashes and, and splatters to get out. So always pour the lye into the liquid. Okay, and then as soon as you do that, that's when the chemical reaction is gonna start. So it's gonna heat up rather quickly. So if you have your, you know, your frozen ice cubes, you add your lye to that, just slowly stir. There's no need to, to get crazy with it. Just take your time. Um, if the temperature gets too hot, you can put it in an ice bath to help keep it within that 120 to 130 degree range. Um, and then, okay, so once, once they're in range, then we combine them. So that's pretty straightforward. And if you have any herbs or colorants that you want to add, combine that all at the same time. Um, so to combine it, we're going to use that immersion stick blender on low. And we want to avoid putting more oxygen and air bubbles into the soap recipe if we can. So keeping it at the right angle, just keep that recipe um, in the bowl. You know, again, just be really safe so no splatters get out. Um, so when we're blending this, uh, it's called bringing your soap to a trace. So hot oil, you guys have seen what hot oil looks like. It's pretty thin. And then the lye water will be slightly thicker. So when we pour it in the bowl, it'll kind of sit on the bottom. We'll start to mix it up. It will be, it'll begin like a kind of like a coffee creamer texture. And then it'll slowly turn to a pudding texture. Um, so again, this is called bringing it to a tray. So we're mixing it. It's pretty thin in the beginning. It'll start to stiffen up. And as soon as you can start to see like some ridges on the top of the recipe or on top of the batter, excuse me, um, then it is to the right trace. So it's stiff enough, but not too stiff where it looks like, like mashed potatoes. Um, so you're kind of looking for that thin pudding-like texture. Um, so we're like between a pudding and a meringue type of thing? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yep. Um, and it takes, it takes a little bit of practice with that too. And the different oils will cause that trace to kind of look a little bit different. Um, but, you know, once you try it, you'll, you'll really get a feel for it. And then as soon as it's, it's too trace, if you can see some of the, the lines on top, if you move your spatula in the batter and it holds its shape and is set, then you can pour it into your mold. Um, and make sure there's no air pockets. If, if you want to add any additional flowers at this time or herbs, you can stick them in then. Mm -hmm. Um a some questions that people have about fragrance, always try to add fragrance towards the end because it can be cooked off by the heat. Um, I know soap fragrance oils are recommended to be put in under 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's typically when it's set up and ready to pour. So as soon it cools down pretty quickly. So it's important to you know have your molds ready because as you're going through this process, you really are um, very hands-on and you can't really like walk away from it. So it'll set up and then you'll have soap in a big bowl instead of soap in a mold. <laughs> um, once the soap is in the mold, it can sit for 24 to 48 hours. Within that first 24 hours, the lye is deactivating. So you um, just, you know, take some time, let it sit in a cool, dark, dry area. If you can put a fan on it, that helps too with um, getting some of that moisture content out. Uh, after the 24 to 48 hours, you can take your soap out and, and cut it up. Um, I mentioned the curing process earlier on, and curing means to let it sit and dry, you know, so the moisture and air can, can get out. Um, so, Okay. Cold process soap must cure for four to six weeks. There are some, some methods to speed that up, um, but I um, you know, recommend letting it cure for that full time. Otherwise, your soap will still be kind of soft in the middle and it'll be a little bit mushy. So the longer it sits, the harder and better it is. 
So if you use that uh, soap before it's, uh, the light deactivated, you could actually burn yourself, I guess. You or, can, like, yeah. So yourself or whatever. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You'll probably just feel kind of <clears throat> itchy at that point. It's it's a lot less reactive, but it will it'll still make your hands itch mm -hmm. and, and be uncomfortable. So after that twenty four hour mark, once it touches that first liquid, then it's then it's safe. Then and that holds true for your dishes too. Whatever spatulas, bowls you're making or using to make the soap, uh, just let those sit for a day as well before you wash them and scrape them out and everything else. Don't be trying to wash the the lye bowl uh, ten minutes after you finish making soap. So. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, I never thought of that. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of fun. You make soap and then you just get to walk away. And <laughs> <laughs> don't have to worry about that later. <laughs> Somebody else can clean up. Yeah. 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 That. I mean, that's how I make soap. It's it's kind of technical, but it's it's no different than making cookies. I know you guys can do it. Well, so actually, I guess, and it, what it boils down to, if you are using animal fat, it's not like you're smearing bacon grease all over your body afterwards. It's like it's chemically changed. It's still longer like an yeah, animal correct. fat at that mm -hmm. point, right? Yeah. It's going to be just as good, if not better, than the bar soap you buy from Dove or Irish Springs or whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah. So It like, feels a lot different on your skin. It's not quite so chemically smelling and just really has a you know, natural feel to it, I guess. Yeah. It's much more moisturizing, it seems. Well, like I was going to ask you, so like the commercial soap processors, in order to save money and mass produce and everything else, do they actually use animal fat or do they actually just find the cheapest stuff they can find? And Yeah, you know? they hardly even have oils in it. It's just like, I can hardly even tell you what they put in it because I can't, <laughs> can't pronounce the ingredients. Well, that's the thing is usually yeah. I eat just like, you know, dihyd hydrochloric acid or something like just what? Like, yeah, yeah. it doesn't make yeah. any sense. But, yeah, um, we don't need that. Well, you mentioned beef tallow, but um, do you guys have like a preferred fat type to use or like one to, to stay away from, like, you know, like chicken fat or whatever? Like, is there some not to use? No, you can use anything. Um, bear fat is awesome. Um, pig pig and cow is most common. Um, yeah, that's what you've been using is pig and cow. I, I would imagine with the different type of animal fats, you might notice some different properties in the soaps, but um, in, in terms of pig versus cow, I don't have you really noticed anything? Um, cow tallow is a lot harder. Pig lard is a softer oil. So combining the two is that, that's what I like to do. That seems to work out nice. Um, just if you use all one kind of fat, like all from a, a beef, it's going to be pretty hard and a little bit more crumbly. Um, I guess I don't know for a bear. Um, a lot of people use goat fat. Hmm. Um, yeah. yeah, anything. Well, usually when you, you process an animal, like when you, uh, you know, get a lamb or this, you can ask for the fat bag or the, the bone bag as well, yep. right? So, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, good way to use it. Yeah. So one thing that's always been kind of wondering about is like when you buy a soap and it's got like the scrubby bits in it, like the little pieces of, I'd call it sand or whatever, but I don't know what to <laughs> yeah. call it. What is that stuff? I'm like it. Exfoliators. Um, yeah. It can be anything. I use a lot of stuff. I use coffee grounds, oatmeal. I've used black pepper. Um, yeah, you can see kind of some of these have little pebbles. I believe this one is coffee grounds. I'm not sure what all you got in there. Grounds. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah, any oh, kind yeah. of, or, you know, if you got almonds, you can grind those up. I, I try to use a lot of stuff that I can either forage myself or that we grow in our gardens. Mm -hmm. um, that we can, have can sprinkle to. herbs on the top, like dry herbs. Yeah, different so lavender. Even things like um, uh, walnut shells and whatnot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pretty good to put yep. in there. Yep, grind them up. Uh, coffee grounds mm -hmm. is actually a good idea, too, because, I mean, what else you can do with them other than maybe compost them? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Brings a lot of the scent into it too. It does. Coffee is really good for the scent. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Um. Yeah. I, I think you already covered the rest of my questions. So that was awesome. I was actually curious as to why the aluminum, but I guess it's, yeah. if it's going to react to something fierce. It's you don't want to bother with it. But. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's true for the salt molds too. No, like steel, metal salt molds. Um, mostly for airflow and drying. Is that right? That's kind of why you want the cardboard or the silicone. So. Well, I guess with the silicone, you could push them from behind if you had to, too, as well, right? Right, and that's the nice yeah. thing with the silicone is they're really easy to take out of the mold. You just kind of peel the silicone back over the soap. Um, with the PVCs, especially the longer you go, if you have like a five-foot wide or five-foot long PVC pipe you're trying to pour soap into, you're going to have a heck of a time trying to get it out. So if you do use air like, pockets. yeah, and air pockets and everything else, too. Um, so if you do use like a round PVC pipe, keep it, you know, one, two feet long, something like that. Um, and cap one end. Yeah, cap one end. <laughs> <laughs> Expert tip, right? Yeah. That's right. 
Now, to avoid air bubbles, would you, you know, as you're pouring it in, best practice is just, just kind of shake it, just trying to get the air out of it, I guess? Or? Yep, just kind of okay. tamp it down. Um, mm -hmm. I'll use a you know, old pencil I got laying around, just kind of stir it in if I can and just yeah. tamp it down. Bump it on the table and if, just kind of pack it down. Yeah, if you leave your trace a little bit thinner, um, it's a little bit easier to control the air pockets right. but if you wait too long it'll really get set up in the bowl and it's it's kind of a mess to work with mm -hmm. and, and it, that's it, um, it happens quick i mean you're looking at like probably a one minute window to kind of get it in the mold if yeah that. yeah so that's where that's fire. where you need to have everything set up ready to go you know don't be okay it's to the right trace not gonna run into the garage and get my pvc or whatever make sure it's all ready to go <laughs> yeah. yeah well i guess trial and error too it's gonna teach you fast exactly yeah best way to learn is to just and do it <laughs> this might sound like a funny question but like when you're cutting it um would you just use like a regular kitchen knife or using like a hot knife to get like a cleaner cut i guess or um yeah you i just use a a chef knife or i have pastry cutters mm -hmm. um they've got the crinkle shape and a straight shape but yeah just a chef knife i've i've thought about getting it wet and then cutting it if it's a really hard bar of soap but doesn't really make a difference if it's hot or wet or mm -hmm. um, you kind of want to cut it in that like right after so you've made soap and you've let it sit for 24 hours to deactivate and you kind of want to cut it between that 24 to 48 hour window get it out of the mold and cut it at that time if you let it go further it's going to get harder harder to cut it, it'll get more crumbly um, it's going to be harder to get out of the mold so that's that 24 to 48 hour window is kind of when you want to get it out of the mold and then cut it up in the bars okay. sweet yeah. Well, good to know. That's pretty much all I had. That's, uh, that's yeah. awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah, it was uh, quite detailed. Appreciate the information. Well, I enjoy teaching other people. There's <laughs> there's enough dirty folks out there. <laughs> <laughs> everyone's got to keep, keep clean. We're already making complaints in the house here to make, to make soap. Right? Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I think we're going to be doing the same. I, I think it's really interesting because, I mean, this is one of the, you know, we, we kind of preach self-reliance um, self on this channel. And this is one of the things that I never really thought about, um, yeah. even even to explore, because I think I've never had um, a shortage of soap, if that makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you look at what's happening today, and it's like, you know, that, that could be a possibility. If yeah, you never know. And I mean, in, in terms of personal hygiene, it's kind of really all you need. You can use the soap to do your dishes. You can use it to wash your body. You can use it to wash your hands. Wash the dog. Wash the dog. <laughs> Actually, that is a good point. I come to think of it, like, would there be a difference between, like, uh, you know, a shaving soap, a dish soap, a body soap, or they just use one for everything? I've been using my soap, my soap when I shave my legs. Um, I make little soap saver bags. Um, you can use it for body wash in the shower. But, yeah, it's, it's moisturizing. The animal fats are... It's actually really close to human fat, so it absor absorbs easily to our skin, so it, it is very moisturizing. Um, a lot of people ask me about shampoo bars. Those are made in a similar fashion, but with different oils. Um, if you wash your hair with a, a bar of my soap, it, it will get it clean, but it will feel a lot different than if you were to use shampoo or a yeah. shampoo bar it might not condition your hair like the pantene pro v or whatever but uh, in the end of the world it's going to be a heck of a lot better than nothing so <laughs> yeah you'll be well, clean guess, that's what it boils down to is like at least it's clean right right yeah. exactly and as we've seen in this pandemic buzz cuts for everyone yeah <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well maybe we'll move into the podcast challenge then yeah um, this week, I would love to encourage you all to find one household cleaner or personal hygiene product that you can make yourself with a better source, more sustainable ingredient. Um, if you're not much of a DIYer, find a local business to support in your area. Um, you can, you know, think about things like your toothpaste, window cleaner, deodorant, laundry soap, lip balm, lotions, um, all that you can make yourself and a lot of it you can save money and and just use use some better ingredients along the way. So that is my challenge for you. Awesome. Awesome. Oh, actually, that uh, I hate to bring us back to the original subject here. Uh, lip balm, is that kind of a similar process to soap making, or is that just like another? Much bowl? simpler. Oh, okay. Very simple. Maybe yep. we'll come, come back to that then. Yeah. Because, yep. I mean, at the very least, for gifts or something, it's something you get to mm -hmm. do. Oh, yeah. Yep. yeah. It can be as simple as beeswax and coconut oil. Melt it together and pour it in a tube. Wow. Well, there you go. It yeah. is way easier. That's all it there is. You go. <laughs> and, and no risks of explosions. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let's move into some upcoming events. 
All right, so we got the uh, so far for another week or so. Uh, we still have the podcast for charity shoot ongoing, hosted by Slam Fair Radio. That's going to be July fourth and twenty twenty in Belmore, New Brunswick, which is the Rest of Goose Gun Club. Uh, this year's charity choice is the Rod Harkwell Memorial Fund. They can register on practice score to buy tickets, and even if they don't do the the shoot, they just love you to register on practice score, make your donation, and be willing to walk away from it just to raise some money for the charity. Uh, so if they don't hear by, I guess we got two more episodes before we know for sure, but. If by the 15th of the month they haven't uh, ended the lockdown, I guess they're just going to cancel it. So that's all we got with that. Yeah. Um, this is emergency preparedness week. Um, go learn some stuff, do some things. Don't be relying on emergency services because although they are coming, you don't want to be the guy that they point at and talk about for all afterwards. <laughs> Uh, and oh, sorry, you go ahead, Ian. I was gonna say we just timed it this week. Actually, we found out it's twenty-five minutes to get an ambulance to the house. So you hmm. timed it on purpose, or you like drove well, from the, the the ambulance base to the to your house? That's a, that's a long story to itself, but we just figured <laughs> we, we discovered it's faster to just drive to the hospital than anything else. So it also doesn't help if you call an ambulance. If a person can walk, don't call an ambulance. If you're not doing CPR, if they can breathe, just yeah. go yourself. Yeah. You're not going to get seen any faster if you show up in an ambulance, just for the record. <laughs> and we have uh, TACCOM Canada 2020 from September 11th to 13th. Uh, the Canadian Program Podcasters Network will be in attendance at TACCOM 2020. Your favorite podcasters will be on hand throughout the show, so make sure you stop by the booth to meet your favorite and pick up some swags. You can also see the details in the show notes for the tick link. This is all, of course, assuming Trudeau doesn't ban every other firearm. Yes, correct. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the year is still early. Yeah. Or, or yeah. we don't get arrested in between, because <laughs> yeah. we're now hard people. All right, so we move into some shout outs. I uh, don't have anything for myself. Mm, yeah, it looks Me like either. Colin's gone, so. Go All right, well, um, feel free to use code CPP20 for 20% off of all my products on my website. If you're interested in a document containing all the information I spoke of today, plus bonus tips and tricks, use code CPP50. For fifty percent off on my website to take it to take part of that savings, um, and my website is www.squeakycleansoaps.com. Awesome! Thanks for the discount code. Yeah, thank Appreciate you. It. Well, thank you for listening. Okay. We'll move you, into, uh, do you have have you shipped in shipped to Canada before? Um, I have not shipped to Canada, but I have shipped to other countries. Okay. Um, We're gonna have price, to change that. It's, yes. It, I mean, yeah, I was gonna say. I'm assuming it's not a controlled substance across borders or anything. It's you know animal products or anything. It's it's fine. No, nope, yeah, it's fine. So. Okay. It's just soap. Yeah, the, the shipping rates will be more than what they are in the United States, but yeah. it'll be whatever USPS postal. We're used are. to that. We're used. Oh to yeah. That. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the thing that happens when you. Yeah, live you know, in yeah. yeah. I think instead of eight eight bucks, it was like twelve. So, too much. But I can I can get it there for you. <laughs> All right. All right, so we're moving to some uh, email and I iTunes reviews. So you got a review there, Ian? Yeah, just a quick one from uh, Donald in Boston. Uh, he just said, I hope you and the Canadian Prepper team are doing well. Still working on his preps. It's going slow because of materials not being available, and the COVID pandemic does not help. He did finish his rain barrel project, as you can see in the attached pics, which I'll have to throw in the show notes there. And uh, he basically just said, it worked great. Thanks to you, thanks to you and Alan for the suggestions. Uh, next is the greenhouse prep, and hopefully I can finish it up soon from Donald. Awesome. Right on. Thanks, Donald. I'm looking forward to seeing the, the next stage. All right. And as far as iTunes reviews go, we are the exact same as last week. So I'm uh, not going to read them all out again. Um, and we've had a couple of emails um, at the feedback at pepperpodcast.ca for job applications. However, I did not feel the need to get ransomware installed on my computer. <laughs> so I did not open them. But he offered some great web services, didn't he? Uh, no, they actually wanted to work at my company. Oh, excellent. Yeah. So we are, however, accepting other panelists. If you want to come and talk on the show, that's fine. But um, keep your ransomware to yourself. Thank you. And I mean, please be human or reasonable facsimile thereof. Yes. <laughs> All right. With that, um, I will bring episode 66 of the Canadian Prepper podcast to an end. Uh, you can find the podcast on iTunes, Podbean, Spotify, or of course, your favorite podcast app. Uh, help us out and submit a review. That way I can read them out in the next episode. 
And we record these shows live on Facebook and YouTube. If you want an early peek at the shows, please subscribe to either channel, uh, either on YouTube. Uh, YouTube at uh, Canadian Prepper Podcast or Facebook.com slash Canadian Prepper Podcast, I think it is. Uh, click the notifications tab. It gives you an alert when we are going live. You can contact me directly on Instagram at PPSWO or Alan with one L at PrepperPodcast.ca. And I can be reached at HFXPrepper at gmail.com or Hughes at PrepperPodcast.ca. And I also have my own YouTube channel. Just search for HFX Prepper. If you have any questions or advice for me, you can email into the show at tyler at prepperpodcast.ca. If you'd like to contact me, I can be reached at soaps at gmail.com. Feel free to find and follow me on social media. I'm most active on Instagram and Facebook, all under squeakycleansoaps, Colleen like my first name. Um, again, my website is www.squeakycleansoaps.com. I have a PDF available for download with everything I've discussed here today, including over 25 bonus tips and tricks. I also offer phone consultations to anyone interested in getting one-on-one -on -one time to have all their questions answered prior to making soap. Thanks again for allowing me the time and space to provide you with the insight that I've learned throughout the years of soap making. Yeah, thanks for joining us this evening. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. It was awesome. Yeah, that was awesome yeah. for sure. Well, you can reach Ian directly by emailing me at theislandretreat at gmail.com. You can also find me on Canadian Patriot Podcast on iTunes and YouTube. There you'll find us discussing why government ruling by decree triggers me. <laughs> it's going to be a boring episode tomorrow, oh, isn't it? Oh, it's yeah. going to be spicy and alcohol-filled tomorrow, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just going to say, if you're, if you're uh, off work for a little bit, you don't have the you don't have the restrictions you normally do, eh? Well, yes and no. I still got to go pick up my daughter from work afterwards, so uh, ah, okay. I'll see if I can get my wife to drive, baby. Well, I look <laughs> forward to uh, listening to the boring episode of no news and nothing happening. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I've, I've cleared my schedule for that one. <laughs> yeah. All right, so you can uh, check me out at uh, rapidsurvival.com. You can get me there on the live chat while you're buying some prepper gear, which is finally slowly starting to come back in the stock. Uh, you can also reach me at uh, feedback at prepperpodcast.ca. And uh, thanks for joining us. And until next time, be prepared, stay safe, and keep learning.